Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this morning's study. And we're beginning a new study. It's uh, going to be Daniel 10, 11, and 12. Daniel's last vision is the name of this study. I know there's other people who do, do studies called Daniel's last vision, but I couldn't think of a better title. So um, before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we invite your spirit's presence. We thank you for this new week and this morning, the time that we have to come together, to open your word, to be instructed by you, to have your Holy Spirit speak to our hearts, to bring a conviction and a power into our lives. We need your presence, Lord. We need you to teach us. And um, I pray, Lord, for all those searching for truth. Uh, you can guide and direct them. We pray for this movement. We know, Lord, that um, these verses, these chapters are important in understanding the time that we are in. And we just pray, Lord, that as we go through them, um, as we have many other times, but this time that we go through them, we can see the application directly uh, to the time that we live in. Help us to pick up on the clues. Um, to see the symbols, to understand them, and apply them in ways that we have never done before. And so we need your spirit, the same spirit that inspired the scriptures, to interpret them for us. Be with each person, bless them, and guide them. Thank you for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> okay, so... <clears throat> This uh, was Colin who actually had wanted me to, to to go through Daniel chapter 11. Of course, you have to start with Daniel chapter 10. You can't start with Daniel chapter 11. There's lots of background. Now, one of the things that uh, Colin asserted um, on December 25th, uh, 2021, is that we were following Miller's rules in the application that he was making. And I'm not saying that he wasn't following Miller's rules at all. I'm just saying in drawing his conclusion, he had uh, made the same error that we saw the pioneers make in regard to Daniel chapter 11, verse 36 uh, to 46 or 45, pardon me. Um, and, and that mistake was not understanding spiritual and literal. And so we're, we're going to see this as we go through this study. And, and I don't know how much time we're going to take uh, to go through Daniel's last vision. Um, we did 391 so far on understanding the lines. Uh, we did 187 when it came to um, uh, examining the foundation, and we did 105 when it came to the book of Ezekiel. So if it's going to be one of those numbers, maybe this be 264, I don't know. But you understand what I'm saying, is that it may take us a lot longer than we think. Maybe it'll just be 49 studies, you know, or 36. I have no idea. But anyway, the way that we're looking at this right now is um, we're going to be using Miller's rules and Miller's rules in a sense in what we would call their expanded form. So we know that when we uh, apply line upon line from Isaiah 28, that that is part of Miller's rules, even though Miller doesn't explicitly talk about it in that fashion, we can see using Miller's rules, we come to understand that the pl pl placing these uh, events, biblical events, prophetic events, these way marks on a line in order um, is part of Miller's rules, right? So we can agree with that, that line upon line in the way that this movement has been doing this beginning in 1989 is part of Miller's rules, right? We agree even if Miller doesn't explicitly state it as such. Yes. Okay. 
Okay, so we also went through uh, in the last study for 391 studies, we came to understand line upon line and the use of palmoni in a way that we hadn't um, we hadn't really applied at least in as much detail. So we know that we can look at things like the Hebrew definition numbers from Strong's, right? So those are things that we wouldn't have looked at before. We can look at uh, the gematria of names um, in the various languages. In this case, we have some Hebrew. Uh, we could look at the gematria of some of these names. We can look at their definitions. We can look at um, the law of first mention. So we can look at a word. Um, so when we, we see that word, we can tie it to another story, and that story will give us some symbols. And the one thing we really haven't done with Daniel 11 is we haven't really placed it upon a line. Parts of it we have. But we need to we need to be able to understand this on a line. So when we get to Daniel chapter 11 and we start to lay out uh, the kings of Persia, one of the things we know is that it's talking about this line of the first three decrees. At least it's connected to that line. So we, we have a lot of tools now. An understanding of of how to create a line. And that's one of the things that we should be doing with this story, just as we were in the book of Judges. I hope uh, people can see that that makes sense. Any, any comments on that? I'm just looking here if I got any emails and you guys can see my email. You'll have an email in just a moment. Yeah, I've seen if you sent any emails. Um, <clears throat> so we know that um, we know that we can we can approach these things in this way. I hope people agree with me on this that this isn't this approach of understanding uh, the Book of Daniel. We have to take all of the tools that God has given us. And we need to be able to place these on a line. So even this first part of this vision, I think that we should create this as a line where this vision is given. Um, I'm not sure how that's going to be created or what the line is going to look like. Um, but we know if we're going to follow Miller's rules, and especially as they've been expanded to understand line upon line, we would have to see there's a period of darkness, time of the end there's an increase of knowledge right that's going to be your first message arriving it's going to be formalized in some way and um, usually in it being given or written out or proclaimed um, spoken right and then you would have it empowered by some event sometimes it's just a symbolic event and and then we're going to have um you know, a second message arrive. And when we do that, when we draw something on a line, we have to see how it relates to our time. So we can look at the line in a sense as it existed in the past, but its application is for the present. So whatever this line is going to look like, it's going to speak to the present situation. So we've never done that with the book of well, with Daniel's last vision, I, I didn't, don't even think with anything in the book of Daniel, have we done it in that direct way, like we did with the book of Judges? So we might find that this isn't going to work easily. We might find that everything falls into place because we haven't done it yet. So we don't know. Now, off to the right, I have Miller's rules. And, and I think that we should be able to look at these rules and, and understand them and make sure that, that we're using them, that we're not transgressing them. Now, one of the things that we, we did when we were looking at examining the foundation, uh, we came to realize that the view that Uriah Smith has in regard to Daniel 11, verse 36 to 45, 
that that is actually the pioneer view. That is, it wasn't some view that Uriah Smith came up with. It was the view that was taught in the Millerite period. And so Smith is being orthodox in that sense. But we know that it's not the correct view. And so when we examined that, when we looked at how they understood this power that, you know, if, if we just, I'm just going to jump ahead here because I'm having this discussion with somebody else. So it's fresh in my mind. But when you go to verse 36 and it says, the king shall do according to his will. And Uriah Smith says, and if it said a king, which it doesn't, right, then it would be introducing some new power. But even though it says the king and he says, well, if it said a king, but it doesn't say a king. So it can't be introducing some new power, which he then claims to be France. But if we look at the language here, this exalting and magnifying himself above every god and speaking marvelous things against the gods of gods and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished, if we understand what that is, but that determined shall be done. We can see that this is referring to the papacy and uh, the last end of the indignation right, which is going to be the 1260. So that's the 1260 of papal authority. Now, he takes these things that they don't regard any God as then that this is an atheistic power in verse 37. But we know that that's the case of the papacy. They don't regard any God. Now, and, and neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women. We know that that refers to the papacy. So, so he magnifies himself above all. That's the papacy. And he's going to honor the God of fortresses or forces, it says here in King James. Right. Which is meaning that this power is going to be looking for military might. And a God whom his father's. Do not shall he honor with gold, silver, and precious stones, and pleasant things. So that's again the papacy. So that can't be France. And so and it says, and at the time of the end, the king of the south shall put at him, push at him. We know that the king of the south here is not Egypt, because this is spiritual, right? So when we get there, we'll see that if we follow Miller's rules that we wouldn't have come to the conclusions that the pioneers did because they, they mistakenly applied the literal when they should have applied the spiritual. And we know before the cross, literal, after the cross, spiritual. When it comes to Rome, 538 AD is the cross, right? It's the midst of the counterfeit covenant week. And so when we go from paganism to papalism, we can't now be applying literal territories, such as the area of, of Syria, Turkey, right? We can't say that, you know, the Ottoman Empire is now the king of the north and Egypt is still the king of the south. We would have to look for the spiritual qualities, characteristics, right? <clears throat> so that's that's going to be important as well. So we know that that's, that's Miller's rules. Okay, so but even uh, they the, even they didn't even they didn't adhere to the rules from time to time. Seems like right. So, and that's what we found by studying, um, examining the foundation. We could see the foundation was laid correctly, but they drew wrong conclusions when they made assumptions when they didn't follow Miller's rules. Right, saying that the sanctuary was the earth, for instance. Could that be supported using Miller's rules? No. Uh -uh. No. There's no way that Miller's rules would support that. It's, it's just not there, right? You can clearly see that the sanctuary is a heavenly sanctuary. If, you, if, the, if Miller would have applied his rules, the sanctuary that needed to be cleansed could not be the earth. So, so we have this, you know, we, we need to follow Miller's rules. We need to understand them. And, and the thing is, we're doing this together, right? So I know I'm leading out in the study. 
for the most part, I guess I will be. Um, we have uh, some some notes that uh, I'm just downloading here that Dwight sent. So Dwight has gone through these studies before and he's created some notes. These aren't updated in any way, Dwight. They're just the notes you had before. The only updating I did was to add in the spirit of prophecy for this particular chapter. Oh, okay. Okay, so these are a little bit updated. And these I'll email out to everyone. Um, for now, we're, we're going to use them. But there, there's going to be a lot more that, um, that we're going to be doing, as I pointed out, that we're going to be addressing. Um, let's get to do this here. Just hang on. Addressing like Hebrew numbers and things like that that we had wouldn't have done in the past. Okay, so so here's the notes what they look like, <clears throat> and they have the. I guess this is from, well, I usually say it's the treasure of scriptural knowledge is how I have it on my e-sword. But it's the the translators from uh, 17, what year is it? 1769. Okay, 1769. And um, so these are their notes. Um, and then he's added, Dwight's added uh, spirit of prophecy quotes that relate to this. Now, when you get um, the spirit of prophecy quotes, are they all of the quotes that Ellen White has? There's a few that are very repetitive. Yeah. So I have not done all of the repetitive ones, which okay. come up later in the chapter. But okay. anything that was at the, the earlier portions have been added in. There's a few that are from non-published writings. Okay. And they are marked as such. Yeah. Because back, you know, in the days, uh, we used to have that, uh, the Daniel uh, volume and the Revelation volume of all of Ellen White's quotes. Of course, it wasn't all of them. Right. Because right? it was none of the unpublished ones. And uh, they intentionally left out some things that they could have put in there. Um, because it appears that she says nothing on the daily, right? In that book on Daniel chapter eight and chapter eleven, there's a there's a couple of quotes regarding the daily. Yes, yeah. And when when you think about it, I mean, in the great controversy, whether it's chapter two or chapter three, I can never remember. But the chapter on the on Thessalonians chapter two in the great controversy is the pioneer view and understanding of the daily. I mean, if you read that chapter, that is the view of the two desolating powers of the daily to change from pagan, pagan Rome to papal Rome, from paganism to papalism. So Ellen White lays out exactly what the pioneers understood about the daily. She just never uses the term the daily there to refer to paganism in the great controversy. But that's what she's talking about. So, so this, this understanding then, you know, has been suppressed within Adventism. And uh, the other thing is, you know, that we're going to look into is, because um, I want to address a few different things that I think are important in the context of how we get things wrong. And one is we dealt with it a bit in the, you know, quite a bit actually in the Telford News a prophecy conference dealing with Atticus Epiphanes, right? So we know that um, much of the, the common interpretation dealing with Daniel is you have Atticus Epiphanes as being this power that's going to, you know, defile the sanctuary, and that's why the sanctuary needs to be cleansed. But it's the same principles are involved in applying when you apply a Tychus Epiphanes as when you try to make uh, France the power in chapter 11, verse 36, etc. right? 
And so we made mistakes. The pioneers made mistakes and this movement has made mistakes. And the question is, how are we going to correct them? And what we have is we have the past as a guide for the present. So, you know, in putting this all together, it's going to take a bit of time. The main thing is I want it to be thorough. So there's not really a limit on this. Um, but also everybody needs to participate. So I always feel like when I'm doing these studies, I'm the ones creating the lines and everybody's just kind of not saying anything. Um, I don't want that to be the case here. Uh, we need participation. Now, some people aren't going to want to speak during the studies just because they're shy or whatever. But remember, you can always write something in the chat. And if you're watching these videos online, you can write me at Theodore James Turner, Theodore James Turner at gmail.com if you want to. Um, or you could, you know, find me on WhatsApp. But I really prefer that people write comments and questions in the YouTube videos themselves. Um, and this, this is because other people watching the video can see those comments. So they may have the same questions. So if you're watching the video and you have a comment or a question, just place it there. Now, sometimes I can be a little bit terse in my reply because I'm busy. And so I may seem sort of um, uh, dismissive. So, but I usually am just sort of seem dismissive generally anyway. So, so don't feel bad if I, you know, if I just kind of treat you like you're, you're wrong or something because you make a comment. I'll, I'll try to be nice. But the point is we need to have those comments in the YouTube videos if you have questions or comments or corrections. And I've had some pretty good ones um, that people have pointed out in uh, the Telford Muse videos. Not a lot, but a few. And, and those are nice to have, even, even if they're not always correct. It's still nice to have those questions there or comments. <clears throat> um, so they start with this, um, Daniel having humbled himself, seeth a glorious vision and is troubled with fear. An angel comforteth him and tell him, tell, telling him of the opposition of the prince of Persia, the assistance he had from Michael and the coming in of the Prince of Grisha promise, promiseth him farther information. So we have first this quote from the Spirit of Prophecy, evening after the Sabbath. This morning I thank the Lord that he has given me some hours of sleep. The first portion of the night I was weary and very nervous. I could not sleep until about midnight. My hip is troublesome unless I have a very easy bed, and it is difficult to find this traveling about. Meetings have been held all day. Brother Robinson spoke in afternoon, in forenoon, pardon me. They report excellently well. There's quite a number from Hamilton. This afternoon I spoke from Daniel's chapters 9 and 10, showing the work of the ministering angels who came to Daniel to give him in vision the communication from God that he had not that he had not fasted and afflicted his soul and prayed most earnestly in tears and with confession and humiliation for naught. He was told his prayer was heard. Now, um, you know, so we're going to look at this. So this is what Ellen White says about chapters 9 and 10. Now, chapter 9, of course, we spent a bit of time on in the Telford Muse Prophecy Conference because I'm, I deal with chapter 9 with the week of Christ studies or the midst of the week study. Um, and if you think about it, so when we have Daniel chapter nine, the basic focus of that is the week of Christ, that midst of the week, Christ being crucified in the midst of the week. And he's making a covenant with many for one week. If we look at Daniel chapter 11, um, this primarily addresses the whole issue of paganism and papalism. Uh, would people agree with me on that? That is, it's an expansion of uh, Daniel 8, um, basically, you know, verse 13, verse 12, verse 11. Um, enlarged, repeat enlarged, repeat enlargement. Yeah, it's an 
because in Daniel chapter eight, when he, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host and by him, the daily was taken away and the place of his sanctuary was cast down and a host was given him against the daily by reason of transgression. It cast down the truth to the ground. It practiced and prospered. Right. And then we have the question. Right. How long shall be the vision concerning the daily and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? And then we have the 2300 days. Right is as the answer and if we look at daniel 9 then daniel 9 he's going to be praying about this because he's trying to understand the this 2300 day prophecy um but he's also focused upon the end of the 70 weeks so he knows that this is something way in the future but in daniel chapter 9 he's now going to be um focused upon well there's this promise about these 70 years I think I said 70 weeks, but 70 years. So he's interested in that. And then he's given the prophecy of the 70 weeks, which is going to commence the 2300 days, right? So he's giving these things way in the future, which is not really what he's looking for. But he is going to be given um, uh, the week of Christ. That is in chapter nine, he's going to be given this study on the week of Christ, this making the covenant, uh, he um, what's the words? Um, confirming the covenant with many for one week. But in Daniel chapter 10, 11, and 12, what we see is the counterfeit covenant. And in Daniel chapter 12, it's going to have this section that this verse that people almost always, well, I would say 99.9 repetent percent of the time approaching 100% of the time, uh, take as referring to the same period as the papal period. That is um, where it says um, in this question, how long shall be the end of these wonders? And the answer is uh, for a time, times, and in half. And when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. I mean, I've never run into anyone who recognized that this is actually the first 1260, not the latter part of the, you know, the latter 1260. That is, this is the first half of the 2520 for Northern Israel, the satanic counterfeit covenant, right? So the counterfeit is the earthly and the heavenly sanctuaries um, that are being counterfeited. Paganism counterfeits the earthly, papalism counterfeits the heavenly. And the new view on the daily, the problem with the new view is that it's trying to incorporate the idea of the heavenly sanctuary into uh, Daniel chapter eight, because we can see once once Christ didn't come and cleanse the earthly sanctuary, we now had a heavenly sanctuary, a development or an idea. I shouldn't maybe call it a development because it's really an idea, a false idea comes in because of the rejection of, of um, a bunch of different things. Part of it is just they're trying to make sense out of, out, of, um, out of this whole issue of the heavenly sanctuary. How do we place that in the story? And so this develops into the new view of the daily, so that the daily is Christ's ministry. And of course, if we had taken that position, we wouldn't have the 2300 days to begin with. If, if Miller had taken the position that the daily was Christ's heavenly sanctuary, there would be no way to start the 2300 days in 457. So this new view of the daily is a rejection of the chronology of the Bible. It gives no basis for the 2300 days or the foundation of Adventism. So this new view of the daily, the, the problem is if they had accepted paganism and papalism, then they could have understood that just the transgression, transgression of desolation is just a counterfeit of the heavenly sanctuary. But that never really comes into play in Adventism. So it, it's confusing for people. So we're going to try to get this all sorted out so that we can understand the daily correctly and we can understand how these two periods, the 1260 for paganism 
and the 1260 for papalism are a counterfeit of the week of Christ. This is a really important point in understanding these things um, and in understanding what, what Colin had presented. Um, there's little pieces of the puzzle that um, need to be put in place so that we can we can understand our lines and how they relate to this history. <clears throat> Now, go back here. Okay. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a thing was revealed unto Daniel, whose name was called Belteshazzar. And the thing was true, but the time appointed was long. And he understood the thing and had understanding of the vision. So when we deal with the third year of Cyrus, what year are we referring to? So we have the third year of Cyrus. When is that? Five, 536 BC. Okay. So what's the basis for saying that that's the third year of Cyrus? Because we know that Cyrus uh, comes to the, well, so Cyrus is the king of Persia and he's been the king of Persia for a while, right? Uh huh. So, we can count his reign in three different ways. We can count his reign as being the king of Persia, because he was the king of Persia even when he was conquering Babylon, because his his uncle was Darius. Darius the Mede was the king of Media, right? He was the Median king. And Cyrus was his nephew. And Cyrus was technically the king of Persia even though he was using the armies of, of his uncle, King Darius, right? So, so he already had, I can't remember what year of reign it was, but he'd been king for quite a long time. So when it talks about the third year of Cyrus, King of Persia, we'd have to say, in what context? Now, we know when he conquered Babylon, his uncle became the king of Babylon. Right. So Cyrus didn't become the king of Babylon until Darius died, right, in the fall of 537. But now it says the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia. Um, are we going to count the third year from because this is how many people do it. They count the third year. The first year they're going to have as. 537 or even 536 and then they would make the third year then 534 um you know if the first year is 536 so why why would you say it's 536 Stephen? what why would you say that the third year of cyrus king of persia is 536 because uh, <clears throat> Just what's going on in uh, relation to the 70 years. Okay. And so, then at least the Jews back to, yeah. to uh, the promised land or Israel. Okay. So in, in chapter 9, he's in the first year of Darius, right? Darius the Mede. Yes. And he's looking for the end of the 70 years. And because he knows that he's been personally in captive captivity for 70 years right and and so he knows that that period has come to an end and and babylon has been conquered right so he knows there are 70 years in the book of jeremiah regarding what would happen to babylon that god would visit babylon at the end of this 70 years but he knows that there is supposed to be uh, you turn to God and confess and he will show his good word in causing you to return to this place right so now here in Daniel chapter 10 we're in the third year of Cyrus and so this is two years later right from the first year of of Darius that's how we're understanding this so then um 
But why is it called the third year of Cyrus and not the first year, I guess is the question. If you understand what I'm saying. Yeah, there would be a, an, an element of co-regency to some level. Okay. So, Cyrus and Darius. So co-regency. So we're saying that, uh, sorry about that blocking there. Just my search here. I've got to find this. Um, of a diagram I'm going to show you. Um, Cyrus is mentioned a lot here. Okay, so here's one that I can show you. <clears throat> okay, so this is the fall of Babylon and Cyrus's accession, right? So when he accedes to the throne, succeeds to the throne. Um, so the fall of Babylon happens October 13th, 539 BC. So at that time, Darius the Mede is in control of the Median Persian Empire. Cyrus is a king of Persia, but Media is in charge. The Median part of the empire is the predominant part of the empire. So however you would try to understand that, it's not it's not really a co-regency in how we would think of it in normal succession of kings. Um, but there's just two parts to Media Persia, right? There's Media and Persia. And so they have an agreement, though, Cyrus has with his uncle, that once his uncle dies, he is going to be king over the whole realm. Now, when kings conquer territories, like when me when um, Cyrus, with the army of the Medes, conquers Babylon on October 13th, 539 BC. Darius becomes the king of Babylon, right? That's how it was done, right? He's now the king of Babylon. And um, then when he dies in the fall of 537, um, and you can see here, I have two different things, the Hebrew civil year and the Hebrew ecclesiastical year in this diagram. So I'll just zoom in a little bit for people to see this. So you can see there, um, the Hebrew civil year goes fall to fall, right? So, and the Hebrew ecclesiastical year um, goes spring to spring. So you can see how these years are lined up. And the civil year, lines up with our year because the primary part of this is 539, right? You can see we got the fall of 540 um, goes to the fall of 539 on our calendar. And so we call this the Hebrew civil year 539. They wouldn't call it that. It would just be whatever year of, of how, whatever they're counting. And then the ecclesiastical year would go spring to spring. So you can see how those are lined up. So when Babylon falls, it's going to be in the fall of 539. But technically it's in 538 on the 1843 charts. The 1843 chart, it says 538, that Babylon falls. And that is if we use the fall to fall year. So just like on the 1843 uh, chart, it has... 1843 at the bottom of the chart, and that's correct, but that's a spring to spring year for the 1335, right? So the 1335 is going to end in the spring of 1844, but it's technically the end of the Jewish year, 1843. And then we have here with the fall of Babylon, this is an ecclesiastical year. This is going to be starting six months prior to the ecclesi ecclesiastical year. So the civil year here is going to be uh, six months prior to the ecclesiastical year. So we can see how 538 on the 1843 chart is correct if it's understood as a civil year. And then when Cyrus succeeds to the throne as the king of Babylon, 
That's when uh, Darius passes away. That's going to be in the year 537. But on the civil year, it would be the year 536. Um, so hopefully that makes sense to people. I'm um, going to just see if I got another chart here. Um, Cyrus has mentioned lots. Okay, in here. I had another chart that I thought was better. I can't find it. Uh, here it is. Okay. <clears throat> so this chart lays out a few more things. Um, so we'll probably be using this. I have to remember that number, 179. Um, so the fall of Babylon, you can see here, 539. The 70 years are completed according to the spirit of prophecy when Cyrus succeeds to the throne of Babylon. And this is that two years here. You can see that. So we get these two years. And then you're going to see in 536 is the first year of Cyrus, right? Now we're saying that this is the third year of Cyrus. At least that's what it says in Daniel chapter 10. But it's the third year of Cyrus since Cyrus has conquered Babylon. Now it says it's in the third year of the reign of Cyrus, king of Persia. So is this reasonable to say that um, the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, it doesn't say in the reign. Okay, so it says if we go back here. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a thing was revealed unto Daniel. So in the third year, it doesn't say in the third year of the reign of Cyrus, king of Persia. It says in the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia. Is that distinction important here? Can he be counting from the fall of Babylon as being the third year from the fall of Babylon? Rather than the third year of his reign since Darius died, right? Because that's the argument I'm making. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I believe that's correct. Okay. Now, in the spirit of prophecy, when we look at her statements regarding Daniel chapter 10, she's not very clear about what this event is. Now, I think it's clear that this event that's going to be talked about, this battle that's going on, has to do with the releasing of the Jews to go back to Jerusalem. To try to take this as something that happened two years later, right? If we t say this is the third year of the Cyrus king of Persia, that is, let's say it's 534 BC instead of 536. Then, you know, what would be this conflict and why would this be such an issue? And, and why would it not be mentioned in any other way? If we can see that the issue is about the, the decree, the first decree being issued, uh, that would make the most sense. But Ellen White doesn't say that explicitly. And most of the commentators look at this as some, something later, after the Israelites had already gone back, after the Jews had already gone back to Jerusalem, to Judah, Judea. <clears throat> okay, so, so that's one of, one of the issues. And these little details are going to be important later on when we start looking at these as an application. But right now we're just looking at the historical background. So in the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, we're going to say that this is 536. A thing was revealed unto Daniel, whose name was called Belteshazzar, and the thing was true, and the, but the time appointed was long, and he, had under, and he understood the thing and had understanding of the vision. Now, um, we're going to look at the Hebrew words here. So first thing, uh, he had understanding... He understood the thing. So this thing here is this Hebrew word dabar, right? So that word can be translated as commandment, right? Word, matter, right? There's lots of different things that can be. It's very common 
Hebrew word. If we look at the, the dictionary here, it's going to be like how many times? A thousand times, maybe more. I don't know. Yeah, 1446 times it occurs in the King James Bible. 434 times as word. 373 times as words, 184 time, times as thing, 56 times as things, Acts 51 times matter, 48, Chronicles 21, saying 20, commandment 15 times manner and matters each 15 times, uh, because 10 times business, eight times said eight, right? So you can see it's translated as lots of different things, some of them very rarely, um, case, commune, dealings like lots and lots of different ways in which this word is translated okay but the but most common way is to just take it as the word right i just always in my mind when i see he understood the word right yeah okay dwight okay but what's interesting to me when we're when we're reading through this yeah okay <clears throat> whether we use this as the word or the commandment mm -hmm. where Daniel is applying this to say that this Dabar was true. Yep. And we're comparing that with what he has at the end of Daniel eight. Yeah. Because the vision that were being referenced in Daniel eight, the vision of the evening morning, Right. So that's what he's referring to is that's the whole point that I was trying to get to. So we have this word here, but this thing refers to a specific thing. Right. A specific word which had to do with the evenings and mornings. Right. So that's what we were going to get to. But in this. Since he is joining the evening morning with what we're seeing here in Daniel 10, which is occurring, what is it, 17 years after the, the vision in Daniel 8? 19. 19 years. Mm -hmm. So this particular vision is being combined with this commandment of the 2300 days. Now, why would we need to see that as a commandment? Well, I sort of disagree with you on that. I don't think we need to see it as a commandment. I, I, I mean, because I don't take it as a commandment. I take it as a word. I mean, you can use the word commandment, but I think of the commandments generally as there's different ways you can take the English word commandment. You can take it like the Ten Commandments, which is the ten words, right? The Decalogue. But, well, but you have also a commandment in the sense of an order, right? As a decree. So, so we can take... Um, you know, Cyrus's decree is Cyrus's commandment. Artaxerxes' decree is Artaxerxes' commandment. Right? It's the same same idea. It's it's an order. But also, I take it as a prophetic word. So when I look at the word debar, I think of it as more as a prophecy. So when I take it as God's word, it's His promise. So that's what I focus on. But it's just probably a little bit of semantics, but. I would agree that it's semantics. The point directly is that this 2,300 days, mm -hmm. if we are comparing it with taking the 2,300 evening morning as yeah. a prophetic utterance yeah, and combining it with the... covenant that God gave from Exodus 20 to 23, mm -hmm. then it becomes something that is necessary for God's people 
to have a full understanding. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. See, it's what I would do is I would go back and say those 10 commandments. I would, I would say that that's not a good translation of the word because when we think of a command, we think of it as an order of something that you should do. I'm going to command you to do something. Okay. But actually, they're not 10 commandments in the Hebrew, even in when we talk about the Decalogue. They're the 10 words. And that is, when God says something, it is true, right? Right. Okay. So God is declaring something. He's not, he's not saying, don't do this. Here is the law of what you are not supposed to do or what you should do. He's, these are actually promises that he makes to us. I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the house of Egypt, out of the land of bondage, out of the house of Egypt, out of the land of bondage, whichever order it's in. And thou will have no other gods before me. You're not going to have any other gods. You're not going to do this. You're not going to bow down to graven images or worship them, right? You're not going to um, take my name in vain, right? You know, you're you're going to you're you're going to remember the Sabbath day, right? Even when he says remember, it, the idea there is that you will remember, right? If I am your God, here is what will happen, because these are promises I am making to you. But all the people said, all that the Lord has said, we will do and be obedient, right? When they made that covenant, they instead of taking God's promises taking God as, at his word, what they were, he was going to do in them. They made a covenant with him, which we call the old covenant, based upon the promises of their own. Our promises, we are gonna, we're going to do this, not recognizing their inability to keep that promise. If they had trusted in God's promise of what he was going to do in them, they would have received the everlasting covenant. But instead, they made this covenant that was a false covenant. And that's that's why I don't like the word commandment with the word debar, because I don't think that's a good translation of it. God is as good as his word. A man is as good as his word. And God, when he spake, it was done. When he commanded, it came forth. Right? So God's promises, his word is true. Right? That's the way that I take this. And, and this isn't the king. And even the idea when it talks about the king's commandment, you know, these are his word. They have a different understanding, the Hebrew understanding of a word is sort of similar to the idea of, you know, man is as good as his word, right? You know, you can trust his word. These are basically promises that are made, not so much rules or laws, which we think of commandments more as rules. And so this, that's why I wouldn't take it as commandment, but that, that's my understanding of it. I don't know if that's okay, Dwight. Well, as we said, this is more semantics. Mm -hmm. And what I'm looking at is in, I'm not looking at commandments as a a direction as a, as much as I am that this is something that God has ordained right for us at this time of earth's history mm -hmm. and that as a commandment it's being set apart for our understanding Mm -hmm. So it may well go with with what you're presenting as far as this being word. So I'm not I'm not trying to disagree or cause a problem. Mm -hmm. No, I know. I, I understand. I'm just saying how why I I prefer this way. Now, the other thing then dealing with that. So we know that the, the, the word was true. Um, MS Hebrew word for true. And it says uh, the controversy was great. Right here, it says the time appointed was long, which 
I have a hard time understanding how they get that uh, from the Hebrew. Um, because there's nothing here about time appointed in Hebrew. Sabah means um, it's um, <clears throat> usually referring to a military campaign, right? So it's it's like a mass of things, usually people organized for uh, a battle, sometimes for worship, right? Now, we usually have the word time appointed. What's the word that's usually used for time appointed in Hebrew? Is it a moed? Yeah, moed, right? So moed is is usually used for that, not sabah, right? So if I was, you know, looking at, at the King James, normally I can translate the King James back into Hebrew because it's it's generally a literal translation. But if I saw time appointed and I didn't know better, I would just think it's moed, right? So I would think, oh, well, this is Moed, and I would have put that word there. I wouldn't look at time appointed in the King James in English and think that that's going to be Tzabah, right? So if it had said Moed, then I would say, okay, put time appointed there. But it doesn't, right? So that word would be a battle. And then you have long. Now, if you look at this word long, uh, it's translated, it, it occurs 530 times, 413 times it's translated as great, high, greater, loud, elder, greatest, mighty, eldest, exceedingly sore, allowed, more abundant, exceeding far, greatness. But it's translated as long once. And I don't think that's a good translation. But because they chose to say that this was a time appointed, I mean, much more to say the battle was great and, or the controversy, right? Because this is talking about the great controversy, in my understanding. Uh, here, Young says the warfare is great, right? That would be a much better translation. But the King James has the time appointed was long. And we have the thing is we have the time appointed mentioned in other places. And there it should be time appointed. But not here. So why would it why what would this mean if we're saying the word was true? We know that the word is the word of the evenings and mornings, right? And the the conflict was great. Let's put it instead of battle or warfare. The conflict was great. So this is referring to the great controversy, right? I could accept that. Between Christ and Satan, which is what this chapter is addressing. Right? So it doesn't make sense to have time appointed as long, but the conflict was great. It makes perfect sense in the fact that this is going to deal with Michael and and uh, Satan, right? Who's going to be called the prince of the kingdom of Persia, right? That sort of power behind the throne type of thing. <clears throat> um, and it says, um, now here it's kind of interesting. Uh, another thing about this, in the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a thing was revealed unto Daniel, whose name was called Belteshazzar. And the thing was true, but the time appointed was long. And he understood the thing. He had understanding of the vision. Notice then that's in um, uh, the third person, right? Right. Then he says, in those days, I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. That's in the first person. Now, in this, do we attempt to place this time of his mourning of those three full weeks 
Yes, we know exactly when they are because he tells us. Okay. Right. Because on he the ends on the fourth, four and twentieth day of the first month. Exactly. Right. So, so yeah. So would he then have been mourning throughout the time of the Passover? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, of course, uh, in this time, they don't have a temple, right? He's he's in Persia, right? So we know that he's, um, because we're going to look at, he's by the river. Well, I guess he's in Babylon, right? Correct. Right. So in chapter 8, he, he's brought to in vision to Persia into the future. He's brought into the future in chapter 8. In chapter 10, he's now by the Tigris, right? That's the Hittical, the Tigris River. Correct? Right. That, right. So he's by the Tigris River in this vision. And and this and and he's not in vision by the Tigris. He is actually literally there. Where in Daniel chapter eight, he's in vision, he's going to be um, by the river Uli in the province of Elam at Shushan in the palace. Um, which is in the future, that he's, he's going to be brought to a time when uh, there's going to be this conflict between Medo-Persia and Greece. He's not even brought to a, a time in Babylon. So in Daniel chapter 8, he's brought to 457 BC. Right? Right. He's going to be brought there. He's going to be brought to the beginning of the 2300 days. And he's going to be bought, brought to a place that later on he's going to recognize when he writes this out. Right. In the, because this is going to be in the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar. So this is 19 years before um, 536. Um, that he has this vision about stuff that at the time he wouldn't have understood. I don't know if he even would have understood where he was when he had this vision. Maybe he would have. But to be at Shushan in the palace, this isn't something, in my understanding of it historically, that wasn't really a thing until Cyrus. So since this is before the time of Cyrus, um, and some people even say in the time of Darius is when it becomes the Shushan in the palace, um, so that he has to be brought to a time after Darius becomes king, Darius the Great. So in Daniel chapter 10, in this vision, he's not in vision by the Tigris River. He's actually by the Tigris River in person, right? He has a vision by the Tigris River. But in chapter 8, he's not mm -hmm. In, in Persia. He's in Babylon. But he has a vision that he's in Persia. Right? Does that, is right. that clear to people? So that's something that's often missed. People just don't notice that detail that this is in vision and that this is a vision in the future. So the reason why he's talking about the 2300 days and he doesn't mention Babylon other than he mentions King Belshazzar in verse one in chapter eight is because he's being brought to the future, to the beginning of the 2300 days, right? He's being brought to that history deal after, you know, after Cyrus, right? He's going to mention, of course, we have Cyrus because we're going to have Medo Persia, but then Greece is going to come. So, so that's going to be in the history in that period of those three decrees and afterwards. So, so it's an important point, just often missed. <clears throat> okay, so in those days, I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. So that's going to be 21 days. Now, we take those 21 days as symbol symbolic of 21 years. 
Why do we do that and where do we place them? Stephen, do you know the, the 21 answer? days? The 21 days, how do they relate to 21 years? Why is he fasting for 21 days? The 70 weeks. Um, uh, sorry, the 70 years of Babylon, if you take away 21, it gives you 49. Right. Okay. And and we know that they're broken in that, broken into that pattern. Um, that the 70 years, uh, um, let me see, I'm just trying to think where that goes. So when, with Daniel, you got from his captivity to the fall of Jerusalem is 21 years, right? And then there's 49 years until uh, the end of the 70 weeks. Right from 586 to 537, that's going to be those 49 years. Yes. And that means that 536 is the 50th year. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that means if it's the 50th year, it's a Jubilee, 536. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes. I'm just hooking up a camera here. So uh, the year of the release. Right, and they, they return to the land. Okay, so so we can see these are all related. So just hang on a second here. I'm not actually getting smaller. That's just I'm walking away from the camera. So and you disappeared too. So okay. <laughs> yeah, there's probably not enough light back here yet until I. Um, I should have set this up earlier. You just keep disappearing into the background. Yeah. Oh, sort of got something going there. Okay, how's that look? Hey, can you hear me okay? You're coming yep. through fine. Okay, yeah, because I'm using the mic on this camera. I'm going to get this set up some other way somehow. But Yeah, you're coming in good, Theodore. Okay. Okay, so hopefully you can see that well. Yeah, yeah, we can good. see it, but it's kind of crooked. Yeah, well, let me see here. Uh, uh, how's that? Better? That's good. That looks good. Okay, so you're going to have... Right? So 49 years here. And then you're going to have... Um, 19 years here, correct? Oh, no, pardon me, 21. I don't know why I put 19. 21 years here, right? Okay, that looks good. Bad looking 21 now. Okay, so that's your 70 years. It's the 70 years complete, right? They need to be completed. That's going to be uh, death of Darius. We know the Babylon falls here. Right? So Babylon falls in 539. 537, Darius dies. Cyrus comes to the throne. Now, this is the accession, right? So that's in the fall of 537. And then you're going to have the spring of 536. And that's going to be called the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia. But it's also the first year of Cyrus, if we count this as his accession, right? So this year here is the third and also the first. And then it's going to be on the 24th of, of Nisan, 
that he's going to end 21 days, right? So there's going to be 21 days in here. And on the 24th day of the first month, his fasting, that's where his vision has happens. Daniel's last vision. Right? It's going to happen on the 24th day of the first month. Now, these 21 days typify these 21 years. Does that make sense to people? It looks logical. Okay. So why is he doing 21 days for these 21 years? Well, beside it being symbolic, beside the fact that this is during Passover, when he's commanded to uh, to eat at certain things, I mean... Well, you wouldn't do that on the... on. You can't do that without the temple. So... The Jews are not keeping the Passover after the temple's destroyed. So is it so is it twenty one days from five thirty six to the twenty fourth day of the first month? I know she draws a little line between them two. Yeah, so what I'm saying is if if this is the twenty fourth, which day does he start on? If it's gonna be three full weeks. He starts in the third. So this is going to be the third day of the first month that he begins his fast. Okay. Okay, now, yeah. help me and explain why you would believe that they would not keep the Passover without the temple when they kept the Passover without the temple during the time of Moses. No, they didn't keep the Passover during the time of Moses without the temple. They kept the Passover when they left Egypt, right? Yeah, but that, but that's, that's not a commemorative. The Passover is in commemoration of that event. So, I don't know. What and they mean. kept the Passover during the time of the tabernacle, did they not? Yeah, they kept the Passover during the time of the tabernacle after they got out of the wilderness. So they didn't keep the Passover during the time they were in the wilderness, right? Okay. Right. So they didn't keep the, they had the Passover when they left Egypt. The first year after they kept the Passover, and then they never kept the Passover all the way through until they entered the promised land, right? Well, that's, that's the establishment that I'm looking for. Yeah, so they never <laughs> kept the Passover during the time in the wilderness, the 40 years in the wilderness and i know this may just be semantics <clears throat> but this is why I, I was asking the question from what you had stated because you said that they had not kept the passover until the time of the temple yeah well I, yeah i'm talking about the temple in the sense of the tabernacle the sanctuary i should have used the word sanctuary okay yeah yeah so they yeah so here in this period of time, the temple is destroyed. Right? That's why I'm talking about the temple. So since right. the temple is destroyed, they're not <laughs> keeping the Passover anymore. Now, okay, so the third, the third day of the first month, was that symbolic for anything that had to do with the Passover? No. It's not the it's, Passover doesn't really start till the tenth day of the first month. When the lamb is selected. Right. So that's technically when the Passover season begins. So the, so this is just one week before that. Right? Seven days before that, right. So yeah. So if if we think about this here in the context, like seven days before he has this one week before when they would normally select the lamb, he starts a week before that. Now, I'm sure he's aware of the Passover season. Oh, uh, you, uh, you got me confused. Yeah. So he so he started his um, prayer on the third, the fasting, the third day of the first month, right? Yeah. And he ended with the 24th of the first month, right? Yeah. So the Passover, wouldn't it start on the 14th day of the first month? Yeah. 
So that would be between them two to 21 days, wouldn't it? Yeah. But y'all are saying it was the week after. The Passover season begins with the selection of the lamb on the 10th day of the first month. Okay. All right. right. So it's right. technically the Passover season. I mean, you have the first day of the first month. You're in the season of the Passover, kind of, because now you're in the first month. And then on the tenth day of the first month, you take the lamb, you select it, and you bring it home. Right. So he's in his fast seven days before that. But they're not observing the Passover in this period. Okay. Same with the Day of Atonement. They don't even observe the Day of Atonement um, throughout that, that period, even after they rebuild the temple. They don't have a Day of Atonement. Right? We can see that in the story of Nehemiah. They don't, they're not keeping the Day of Atonement because they don't have the Ark in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. And, and they're mourning the fact that they can't keep the Day of Atonement. But they decide to keep the Feast of Tabernacles, even though they can't observe the Day of Atonement. So, you know, we just make the assumption, you know, they're, they're going to be keeping the Passover, but they're not. Same when okay. Ezra leaves Babylon, he's going he's gonna to be traveling during the time of the Passover. They're not keeping the Passover. Okay, now there's a comment from the chat. I'll read this quickly. Mm -hmm. The chance that Daniel did have access to the usual Passover herbs, as in asking for pulse in Daniel 1. He and his pious companions had been bold enough to keep the Levitical requirements in Daniel 1, and he defied the king's order in Daniel 6 and continues to pray without ceasing, without concealing this. Mm -hmm. And I think he might have obtained what was needed for the Passover. Okay. I, well, I don't understand that. So well, the, the point would be and in in considering that thought, mm -hmm. Daniel ten three says, I ate no pleasant bread, neither came flesh nor wine in my mouth, neither did I anoint myself at all till three whole weeks were fulfilled. And the alternate Hebrew for the pleasant bread is the bread of desires. Okay. Yeah. Well, the point is he's fasting. He's not keeping the Passover, right? Right. And, and they weren't keeping the Passover in this period. Daniel's even, even um, now I'm not sure about the reference, what, what that would have to do with the Passover in 607, because the temple isn't destroyed until 586, right? So, so obviously Daniel would be wanting to, to observe the holy days, um, even when he was taken captive. But after the temple is destroyed, uh, sanctuary service has, has been ended by God, Right. Wouldn't that, there would also be three days before the 21 days, would there's another three right there, ain't it? Yeah, yeah, well, that's how you get 24, yeah. So, that, but he doesn't start fasting until the third day, and then he's going to fast three, three full weeks, so it's going to be 21 days. And in this case, it's three full weeks, that would be a cardinal count rather than an ordinal, ordinal count. That's the way I would take it. I could be wrong. It could have technically started on the 4th and went to the 24th, but I take it as being a cardinal count. But, but, this, but this is the point here is that he's typifying, the, what I wanted to get to is that this is typifying this. So we know this 21 years is followed by this is, they should have had a jubilee here, right? How do you spell Jubilee? One L. I can't remember. So one or two L's in Jubilee. It doesn't matter. One. Okay, so Jubilee, right? So this is going to be destroyed in a Jubilee year. Right? Okay. Like the Jubilee year is supposed to begin that fall in 586. Should have been the Jubilee. 
So it's really destroyed in a sabbatical year, I guess you should say. That that would be a better way of putting it. Right. But th that's why I put the arrow after, right? So you have 586, the temple is destroyed. And now 49 years later, you're going to have the accession of Cyrus. And then they're going to return in the year of the Jubilee. Right? Okay. So, so he, this is, this is technically this, this period here, 536, this is the 50th year. If this is the 50th year. Does that make sense? Because the 49, 49 years to have 50th. I think it's pretty awesome. Okay. <laughs> right. So, so this understanding of the 21 years, you can see the 21 days he needs to fulfill these 21 years for the Jubilee to happen. That's just my point of why it's 21 days. This 21 days is for these 21 years from when he was taken captive to when the Jubilee should have occurred. So now he's doing these 21 days and then he's given this promise about what's happened. That is the decree. I believe the decree is issued on the 24th day of the first month. So this is also the date of Cyrus's decree. Okay. That makes sense. It's quite a bit to think about. Okay. So now you can see my room here. Um, <clears throat> so that's the way that I understand these three full weeks, that these are typical of something, and they're typical of the 21 years, and that this is about the great controversy. So we're just kind of starting in here, um, you know, to look at these things. Our time is up, uh, but we'll come back to this tomorrow. So. Let's close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful for this study and the time that we have together. We ask for your Holy Spirit to continue to be with us, to teach us, to guide us, and uh, forgive us for our sins. Help us to trust in you. We pray for a blessing for each person. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.